excited are we to have George Leia and Telly here today? I am so thrilled that all three of you are here. I've seen Allegiance twice on Broadway. It's not only worth seeing, it's worth seeing multiple times. Um, George, I'm gonna start with you because this is such a personal story. Um, can you give us a little background on your history and how it shaped uh, the formation of this musical? Well, I was five years old at the time that uh, the soldiers came to our home to order us out. And we were first taken to uh, the horse stables at Santa Anita Racetrack because the camps weren't built yet. So that was our temporary, what they call, assembly center. And this is because uh, America was at war with Japan we, and the government... Pearl Harbor had been bombed and we Americans of Japanese ancestry happened to uh, look like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. And mass war hysteria and racism and the failure of political leadership uh, put us into those camps. And the failure of political leadership is very important right now. I mean, it's, we, we sense the echo of 75 years ago here. Back then, California had, a, had an attorney general, the top attorney of the state. He was a good man. He knew the law. He knew the Constitution. But he was an ambitious politician. He wanted to run for governor, and he saw that the single most popular political issue in California was the get rid of the Japs movement. And so this attorney general became an outspoken leader of the get rid of the Japs movement, and he made an amazing statement. He said there have been no reports of sabotage or spying or fifth column activities by Japanese Americans, and that is ominous because the Japanese are inscrutable. You don't know what they're thinking, so we better lock them up before they do anything. So for this attorney general, the absence of vivid evidence was the evidence. A lawyer making a statement like that. And this fed into this mass hysteria across the uh, nation and, and got us incarcerated. Just to reiterate, this is while it, it is certainly a part of the plot of, of Allegiance, which is now on Broadway, this is what actually happened to you when you were five years it old. Actually you actually You and your family were taken from your home, sent to a horse stable, and then sent to an internment camp. In the swamps of e southeastern Arkansas. There were 10 camps all together, all in the most godforsaken places in this country. Our story takes place uh, in Heart Mountain, Wyoming. Uh, a desolate, um, forbidding, you know, uh, the, the high plains. Very dusty, very cold in the wintertime, very hot in the summertime. There were also uh, camps in Wyoming, or Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, and two in California, and two, can you imagine, on that blistering hot desert of Arizona. Ten of them all together. Well, your story and especially the way that you have risen from that internment into the amount of success that you have had. Uh, of course, Star Trek is uh, where most people learned your face um, and you still have countless fans around the world from, from Star Trek. We lived long and prospered. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that, George. I think that you, you have, uh, I can cross something off my bucket list for having uh, seen you in person say that. Um, this story is fictionalized though. Right, uh, you've taken the, the, the seeds of your story and planted them and made them grow into something new, uh, which into also- Into a flower. Yes, An into a flower. flower. Um, <laughs> and uh, th that actually, that metaphor is echoed in the show, which you'll see when you go to uh, the Long Acre Theater. Um, Leia, can you talk about how uh, your character fits into the story that George has laid out? Okay, um, I play kind of, well, what has become an amalgamation of quite a few different characters over the course of the development of the show. Um, I became involved with Allegiance in 2009 as a completely different character with a completely different arc and a very different name. Um, I started out as Gloria, who was actually going to be Sammy's sister-in-law, because at the time there used to be an older brother named 
James, but then he goes off into he goes off into war and is killed. So we should just say Sammy is the lead character in the show. Tally yes, Leung, which is Tally uh, Leung, plays uh, the this um, very uh, headstrong and motivated patriotic American who is yeah. determined to fight on behalf of his country, America, in the war against Japan. Right. And once Mark Aceto came into the process before the show was um, got its production in San Diego, all these characters, there was, there was a mother, there was the older brother, they were killed off. And, and, uh. and the storyline was streamlined, and, which, which meant having to sacrifice a few beloved characters. Um, but you but a don't lot of them just ended up write Leia Salonga out of a Broadway show. No. <laughs> No, so, so they I ended found up, a new spot. So I ended you. up being the older sibling, and the maternal figure, while still being this kind of older sister character, um, older sister figure to Sammy. So that became Keiko or K for short. So everybody calls me K, um, and I figure as as a maternal character who is very compliant with pretty much the environment around her um, because of her mother passing away when she's a, a very, like a burgeoning, you know, a, like kind of becoming a woman, all of this responsibility that used to fall on the mother now falls on her. She pretty much raises Sammy, um, watching over him as he grows up. Um, she is the one that takes care of the grandfather, which George also gets to play in the show, and the father figure. So it's it's this very close knit um, family unit. Um, but there are things that happen once the internment takes place, and she then starts to, in the desolateness of Heart Mountain, she begins to blossom, yeah. and she begins to then figure out who she is as a human being, as a woman, who she is in relation to members of her family, and she starts to really think for herself as to what her opinions are on the internment, on the war, on the violation of the constitutional rights of this entire community. And she falls in love for the first time with a man who would end up being a resistor, Frankie. And that kind of also shapes who she is. So that's, in a nutshell, in a very big nutshell, that's who she is. The I polar opposite of your brother. Exactly. I want to also just take a moment to compliment you on Hire, which is Thank you. a pivotal moment. It's, it's just, it's a, a key moment in the show where you are standing alone on the stage. It's a gorgeous bad, uh, ballad. And uh, I think that it's, it's destined to be in your songbook forever. I think that it's, yeah, it's, it's, been a, in my it's a new for a signature song for you. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess it, not that new since you started this process years ago. Yeah, but. it actually, how that song came to be, um, pretty interesting. J. Quo, who wrote the song, calls it, it's like a fashion designer making something for a, a, the Oscar red carpet mm -hmm. that's custom for somebody who's going to walk on the Oscar red carpet. And it didn't exist until very late in the rehearsal process of the production in San Diego. Which was um, uh, 2012? 2012. Mm -hmm. um, and Jay tells the story far better than I ever could. But I think it was when he was so sleep deprived and seemingly depleted of every little bit of mental energy that he could muster, that's when he finally could hear the song in his head. It was like, we, we need to make sure that all of the junk that you normally have in your head is gone mm -hmm. before you can hear the song. And once he heard it, he put it down on paper. Um, I think that was a Monday. I learned the song maybe a day or two after. And that Friday, I think, we was sits broke. We put it into the show. And, wow. and yeah, so I'm very pleased. And it has gone virtually untouched since that production. A few lyric trims here and there, but it's, it, it is the song. I remember that moment of, you know, we didn't have a song for three or four weeks of rehearsal for Leia. And, you know, you have, no. Leia, you have Leia Salonga in a show and she doesn't have a song. So there was this, like, pressure, there was this pressure on this team to write something. And I, you know, and very much in the way that this community, you know, in the kind of the desolateness of Heart Mountain, they found a way to survive, and they found a way to create beauty out of nothing. I mean, that really is what Allegiance is about, this community, Absolutely. this family that finds beauty and has moments of awakening out of a moment where they felt like they lost everything, and they, they were able to find themselves in that kind of emptiness. Mm -hmm. And I think our creative team went through the same kind of process, journey with the show, where they felt like, we have nothing left, 
and we were in front of an audience in a week. And then all of a sudden, the song dawns on them. And so I, I remember it was kind of a magical moment when we all heard you sing it for the first time. We said, that's it. I you love how life imitates art in that yeah. way. And I do want to just stress that even though a lot of the, the subject matter in this show is very dark, there are some incredible moments of levity. There's so much beauty. There are laughs in the show. Um, George, in particular, I think that you are just the heart of this, this show, and there are so many smiles, and it really has an uplifting uh, image. I think sometimes when we talk about a show based in war and based in oppression, that that can be a little bit like, oh, do I want to go out to see a night of theater where I'm just going to be depressed? But this is not a depressing story. It is a joyful, wonderful, lovely story. And I'm so glad that it ju was just announced a couple of days ago that there will be an Allegiance cast album, which means that even if you don't have a, ch uh, yeah, yay. <laughs> Even for people who don't get a chance to come to New York to see the show, uh, the music will be out there for the world to hear. Telly, what's your favorite number to sing in the show? Um, I, I uh, gosh, I have so many, I have so many fav favorite numbers. Um, I, you know, just just on that point about how this community kind of found a way to survive this through joy, through, through being together, through finding the joy in one another, even though they were imprisoned in this camp. There's a number called Get in the Game that's in the show that is about, it's about how this community is trying to find a way to pass the time, to make life better there. You know, at the time, nobody knew how long they were going to be there. So they had to kind of rally with each other and go, what are we gonna do? You know, how are we gonna, how are we going to create community out of this place? And what they landed upon was forming a, base, a baseball team and actually having kind of an intramural sports game in the camps. And you know, this is actually based on historical fact. There was an actual Heart Mountain All-Stars, a baseball team. They had games against the, the Caucasian guards. You know, I mean, this was an actual real thing that this community did. And it's so interesting. When I first was asked to be a part of the show and I started doing the research, it wasn't all of the, the sad parts of this event that actually moved me what moved me is how this community was able to get on, even though they were trapped in this place. I mean, that they were able to form baseball teams and have camp dances, and they were able to, you know, form even their own schools in, in and that. And the farming, and the, the farming. And farming, mm -hmm. you know, f farming and dry, dry land. They were able to plant seeds and grow vegetables in a place where people said it is impossible to do that. So, I don't know, this community making the impossible possible, I think, is what really moved me about the story. Well, that moment in the show, too, I think illustrates something that is key to the reason that this story needed to be told, which is baseball is as all-American as you can get. And there's one thing I know that George objects to strongly, which is when people refer to these camps as Japanese internment camps, because these were not Japanese, these were Americans. And what could better uh, illustrate that than the fact that they chose to have like square dancing parties and play baseball. Yeah. So much boogieing and yeah. the love of the Andrews sisters and Frank Sinatra and George tells a story of being, of his barrack being across from the mess hall where all the teenagers would have their camp dances and hearing the music, the 40s big band music coming in through his window and him being up at night and listening to it. We were children. We were supposed to be asleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I also love that about this show. You know, there's a sound, there's for all of our music fans and music theater lovers out there, there's a sound to this show that is, that is um, something that Jay Quo and our orchestrator, uh, Lynn Shankle, has created. It's this beautiful combination of music theater music, but also um, the sound of the 40s, that mm -hmm. kind of swing and Americana. Andrew sound. But also there's elements of also a Asian music and pentatonic scales and things like that that are very rev prevalent, you know, and, inst and instrumentation as well from, you know, there's koto in the show and there's, you know, so I mean- Oh, those drums. Oh, like those drums. High school drums. And, I mean, so the combination of kind of all three of those styles, actually I've, you know, it's my fifth Broadway show, I've never heard a show kind of orchestrated or sound like this. So I think audiences are also in store for something really and new and And all this fresh. is organic. I mean, it's not like separate and apart. It's organic to the telling of the story. Leia and I have a song uh, titled uh, uh, Ishikara Ishi, and that captures both the philosophy, stone by stone, you can move a mountain, and the origami flower, too. 
is made out of a loyalty questionnaire, the notorious loyalty questionnaire, which right. was really an offensive piece of paper. So and yet this, is, uh, this is another key uh, element of the show. In order to, uh, to weed out potential uh, Japanese Americans who were, uh, what, well, troublemakers, troublemakers, they asked them questions on a piece of paper, and a couple of the questions were, were sh sort of worded in a shady way. Well, the most way. offensive one was 28, which was one sentence which had two conflicting ideas. It asked, will you swear your loyalty to the United States of America, and will you forswear your loyalty to the Emperor of Japan? We're Americans, and for the government to assume that we have an inborn racial genetic loyalty to the emperor was outrageous. My mother was born in Sacramento, my father was a San Franciscan, and uh, I as a child uh, uh, didn't have to respond to the loyalty questionnaire, but I was born in Los Angeles. And for th the government to assume that we have a, a inborn loyalty to the em emperor was outrageous. So if you answered no, meaning I don't have a loyalty to the emperor to forswear, you were saying no to the first part of the very same sentence. If you answered yes, meaning I do swear my loyalty to the United States, then you're confessing that you had been loyal to the emperor and were now willing to set that aside and re-pledge lo your loyalty to the United States. It was an outrageous, offensive, insulting questionnaire, which we turn into a beautiful piece of origami flower. I don't know which, if you can see it, but I'm wearing a little, um, a little pin that is the actual logo for Allegiance. Oh yeah, of course, it's, it's on, the, on the playbill. So they actually took this offensive questionnaire and folded it into a flower uh, that Kay at one point wears in her hair. During the dance. During yeah. the dance, and yep. It, and it was really that questionnaire, I mean, to put it into perspective, that is kind of, it's the most kind of shockingly relevant part of our show that mm -hmm. makes it so relevant for today because it's, it would be as if we all said today that we assumed all Muslim Americans were terrorists. Right. I mean, it's as offensive as saying that now. Yeah, it would our, be like if you put world. a piece of paper that said, uh, do you promise to stop being a terrorist? Right. Which would make them say, uh, sort of acknowledge that they had at some point been one. I mean, it's, it's, right. And that's what, that's, I don't know, I think that is the, that is the thing that I, I can feel the audience every night during the show, during this part of the show, where they go, oh my gosh, this, was, this happened in the 40s, but mm -hmm. it is happening actually it's, right now. It's way too relevant, and there's so much like lyrics in the show, and sometimes they'll just hit me and I'll start crying because it's like, I don't feel like this happened in the 1940s when Chris Nomura is like, you, you and him are like having at it, and, we're, and George and I are sitting at the table, and he says the line and points to his face. He says, we look like enemy, and I'm just like, okay, that's just hitting way, mm -hmm. way too close to home right now. It's, it's too, it's, it gets scary to, to be up on the stage and, and listening to all of this, and I just have to sit there and, and wait for the moment to pass. It's too... The headlines, it's, it's, every it, it's political, you know, the uh, re Republican campaign, they are mouthing the very same phrases and sentences with slight uh, 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 distinctions for, for our time that we heard back in the 40s. The broad brush characterization of a group of people. All Syrians are supposed to be terrorists, and that's why we're, gonna, we're not gonna accept any of them. That's the very same kind of way that we were characterized. We were all the enemy. And the more fastidious ones said we were non-aliens. What's that? A non-alien, that's a citizen. Mm -hmm. But we were uh, not described as citizens. We were non-aliens. Well, that questionnaire leads to the central conflict in the show right. and um, actually leads to a separation between Sammy and Kay. Uh, Kay says, I will, uh, I, you know, I will not make this statement. I'm going to answer no on the questionnaire. Well, Kay, actually, no. She, she doesn't go quite that far. A lot of the young people actually did put Yes, yes, and yes, and I would assume that Kay, Kay did, but being a woman, I don't think that she oh, would have right. been sent on active duty anyway, and Sammy, being as American as he is... There were women is, who responded to that. With, with no, yeah. yeah, but I'm... And yeses. Oh, yeah, but I'm, well, one I'm of assuming, the things though, about that this, question, this character does, did not say I, I no, suspect that Kay left it blank. Mm. Possibly. 
But Sammy was so eager to actually enlist in the war that the opportunity to swear his allegiance to America um, canceled out his worry about the second half of that question, and he actually did go off to war. Yeah, there was a deep belief um, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the young, you know, there, after something like that happens, you know, and I, I can only equate it to, you know, I'm a New Yorker, after 9-11, there was kind of a wave of patriotism, of, of defending your country, of, of defending your loved ones who live in this country, and, and, um, and you we're seeing that again with Paris, how Parisians, they're saying there's a, there's a huge wave of nationalism in, right. in France right now, and it's, and same thing, Sammy's character goes through the same thing where the bombing of Pearl Harbor happens, and he's an American kid, born in California, so what does he do? He goes and he enlists. Of course, when he goes to enlist, he actually gets rejected because he happens to look like the enemy. He happens to look Japanese, or his, his family was from Japan, even though he is pure, you know, pure-blooded American. So, um, so when it came time for the loyalty questionnaire to come down in question number 27, the one that was before, the, the offensive question, the two-part question was, will you bear arms to, to serve your country? And of course, Sammy answers yes, that they're now going to allow the young people from these camps to serve. Now, in hindsight, you know, now that we can look back on it, it was because there was a, a man, a, an actual shortage of men to draft. So they, you know, the government said, well, we have all these able, able-bodied American men in these camps. We should draft them to fight in the war. And, but uh, many of these American, these young American kids like Sammy, they felt like, well, if I volunteer to serve, that will prove that we are as American as everybody else. And if we can prove that, they will let our families go. And that, there are so many men who volunteered and said yes to that. And actually, they were all uh, part of the 442nd Regiment, which today continues to be the, the most decorated unit in, 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 in military history, you know, and they, they fought with valor and they fought um, in Europe and, um, and they fought some of the most dangerous, dangerous missions and suffered the most casualties, but they fought very bravely and, and they're still celebrated today as one of the most decorated units because that was where their patriotism came from. It was from a desire to prove how American they were so that their families could one day be free. This but the tragi tragi tragedy that follows that is after the war, the victors which were the 442nd, vilified the resistors and those that answered no, no. And in our play, it fractures the family, but symbolically, it fractured the Japanese-American community. And that fracture still exists today with many, many families. Well, I, I think the show does such a wonderful job of celebrating Sammy's uh, patriotism um, as a symbol for the patriotism of all of the Americans of Japanese descent at that time. Um, hopefully it does teach a lesson that is universal to what we're going through today. Um, I highly recommend that everyone go see Allegiance. See it more than once. Start by seeing it once. And pick up the cast album when it comes out. We have time for a few questions from the audience. Uh, so I wanted to ask really quick about like your decision to make this a musical because uh, I'm a musical percussionist and everything and like the grind of what what it goes involved is already difficult and then when you do the tragedies it weighs on you at times where you're just like don't cry you got to get through the song and then knowing that this is a part that's really like a part of your life I mean it's a lot for someone of your status to actually decide to do this and was it always going to be this way or was there ever like a hesitation about reliving this constantly? Telling, <clears throat> telling the story of the internment of Japanese Americans has been the mission of my life from my 20s. I've been on speaking tours throughout the country and internationally as well. We founded a museum called the Japanese American National Museum to keep that story alive in perpetuity. And it's always been my, I wrote an autobiography uh, which I, uh, had thoughts of dramatizing. But then a chance meeting in a Broadway theater with Jay Kuo, uh, and we started talking about uh, uh, this production. And uh, I told him that I'm thinking of a drama. And uh, Jay said, oh, absolutely not. Musical theater has the power of hitting people so profoundly here. And particularly Japanese Americans who culturally are ra rather contained and reticent. Music and singing affords that character to 
externalize that thought uh, musically. And uh, I, being a fan of musical theater, I absolutely agreed and saw the logic of uh, uh, his argument. And that's how it became a musical. As a follow-up, George, I, have, I know that you are a social media legend. And is it true that you created your social media accounts 10 years or so ago, specifically so that when the time came to promote Allegiance, you would have a platform in which to do so? Well, I had a blog even before that, uh, primarily directed at uh, sci-fi geeks and nerds. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> But uh, then when we started working on Allegiance, um, again, it was Jay's idea. It's um, a wonderful medium to build an audience, particularly when we have a subject matter that uh, could be considered uh, sobering. We want to tell it as a musical. And so we, first of all, had to educate the, aud the audience to the uh, history because there are so many people that still to this day don't know that chapter of American history. So this is a wonderful way to raise the awareness of the, uh, uh, that chapter of American history. And then once that level has been reached, then to uh, introduce the fact that we have a musical on it mm -hmm. and build an audience, tilling the soil, so to speak. And uh, by the time we're ready to open, we had a whole nation of people that knew about Allegiance, were enthusiastic about Allegiance, and in San Diego, our run was a record-breaking run. We had um, full houses throughout the run. Uh, the Old Globe Theater, a very respected uh, community, regional theater, uh, has a 77-year history, and we broke their 77-year history for both box office and attendance. And so here we are in this great big market of New York, which is much, much more competitive than San Diego. And we're disco discovering that selling our show is a real challenge. Well, hopefully a, a lot of people who see this interview today will buy tickets. Do you have another question from the audience? Hi. Um, I saw the Broadway two weeks ago. This one to say that you guys were amazing. I'm seeing you on stage. Like I thought the songs were lovely and the story was like so inspiring to everyone who loved the history. And I want to know is that what is your plans for the future and do you see this Broadway going on tour? Well, um, Lorenzo and I have been talking. Lorenzo is one of the uh, producers is, and also one of the book writers. Well, a co-book writer and uh, our lead producer. Um, we envision a uh, road company, but we want to uh, have the imprimatur of uh, Broadway first. And so that's why we're here today, to urge you all, you know something about uh, Allegiance now, go out, organize a theater party, and tell all your friends and relatives all over the uh, metropolitan New York area, and come to Allegiance so that we will have a road company. You know, there's also, um, uh, what I also love about what Lorenzo and, and his team are, is doing is that the, the, the goal, the real deep goal is to get as many people to hear this story as possible. So, you know, our, our plan is to be a part of that. You know, our plan is to get this message to as many people as possible. And th they've even started a program called Inspire Change where they're bringing students in. You know, they're subsidizing students to be able to come in and see the show because you know, this, it's more than just, I really do, I really believe this is more than just a show, that this story needs to be told right now at this moment, and especially to the youth and to the next generation of people, because they are our future lawmakers, you know, senators, presidents, those, the congressmen, you know, those are the people that are, that are kind of paving the way for our future. And they have to learn about this part of our history so that they can create a better world when they're adults. So it's, it's about getting the show out there and this story out there in a way that reaches the most people possible. So that is, that's really our plan, whether it's, whether it's doing it here in New York, taking it on the road, you know, streaming it at some point. You know, that, that's my, my goal is to someday have every student know this show and this story and this music. I know. think the bottom line for Broadway across the board is the better the show does in New York, the more likely it is to tour. Yeah. So get tickets here and you're more likely to get tickets out in there. In hometown. Yeah. yeah. Leah, you've toured a lot. Um, around yeah. the world doing <laughs> solo shows and, and 
concerts and musicals all over the world. I know you're extremely beloved in the Philippines. Um, actually, when I said I was going to be here today on Twitter, uh, the amount of response I got from your fan base, both there and here, was overwhelming in the best way. And they asked me to send their love to you oh, here in you. person. So um, consider that love. Thank you very much. You. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. I also yeah. want to take a moment to promote the fact that Telly has a new album out. Oh, yeah. It's called Songs for You. Yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful, jazzy mix. Oh, yeah. Beautiful mix of musical theater songs, um, some pop songs, everything from Billy Joel to Michael Jackson. Um, and uh, it's, it's fantastic. So I think everyone should go out and, uh, and get that. And for those of you who don't know, George has uh, a sort of not so secret uh, life as a, a member of the Howard Stern Show <laughs> on Sirius XM Radio. And, oh, um, my. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, uh, George, I love listening to you on that show, and it, it's a little bit more uh, of an adult adult content. Um, you may learn more about George and his life than you ever thought you wanted to know. Um, but uh, uh, but I know Howard has been talking about Allegiance and the show for for a long time, so so we appreciate that support. Uh, when will Howard come and actually see the show? Well, uh, Howard did come to the opening to the red carpet as a uh, friendship uh, gesture. And he was terrific. And uh, many people, uh, and got and talked about it on the show. Uh, but ta uh, he is a very visually compelling person. He's and, six foot six or something, Yes, right? and lean and tall with a wild mane of hair. And uh, he uh, said, I'm what's known as uh, visual obstruction if he goes to the theater. <laughs> And so he doesn't want to be that. And so he's, he, uh, and he doesn't want to be uh, cra surrounded by fans and immobilized uh, coming in and leaving. So uh, he's going to come very discreetly. And he's going to sit where uh, he won't be an obstruction. And he's going to leave very discreetly. So uh, that is the understanding we well, have. Well, look, he has no excuse. I went to, to a show where President Obama was in the audience. If he can be snuck in and snuck out, then Howard has no excuse. He has secret service. Well, that's true. <laughs> um, and no one else has any excuse to miss this show either. It's such a fantastic production. I'm so proud to be here with you guys today. Congratulations on all you've achieved, and hopefully Allegiance will have a good long run on Broadway Thank and you. beyond. Thanks, everybody, for being here with us. <laughs>